Welcome, everyone, to Couch Potato Diary. Happy Tuesday. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. So, uh, if you missed it on Facebook, and we kind of talked about it last week, next couple weeks going to be a little different around these parts. I have a lot of different obligations going on, and so the live show is taking a brief pause, uh, but still want to be getting out at least four podcasts a week for all y'all to enjoy. Uh, so, didn't get one yesterday. We will be doing one here today. We're actually hoping to do two today. I don't know why I keep saying we. It's... It's me. Uh, but coming up on this show, going to be doing a recap of what we saw from the National Football League, the Canadian Football League, and uh, UFC up in Edmonton, and WWE Crown Jewel out in Saudi Arabia. Should be a fun show. Let's get right into it and talk some football. The Ultimate Fighting Championship was in Edmonton. We're going to get to that in a little bit, uh, but we will start with the NFL. The National Football League trade deadline has come and basically gone now, and uh, quite a few moves. We're going to kind of weave those in as we do the, the recap here, but I, I think the biggest news from the weekend is the New Orleans Saints firing head coach Dennis Allen. That was a dreadful loss against the Carolina Panthers, and the type of losses that, or that's the type of loss that gets coaches fired. Um, and so this was one, I kind of feel similar to the Robert Salah one. Obviously, it doesn't have quite the same um, magnitude given the difference in New Orleans and New York when it comes to media coverage. But I, I, I think that this is a flawed roster and coaching isn't necessarily just the biggest problem out in New Orleans. But I also don't think Dennis Allen is a very good coach and I don't think he's doing anything to fix the problem with the Saints. So I really do feel like this is one of those teams that needs to start over. They have tried desperately to kind of string from the Breeze era into whatever, I guess the Derek Carr era here now, and they have tried to do that while being just severely hamstrung by the, the salary cap and trying to make these little moves to be able to just get enough to try to just get by in a division that you actually can kind of just get by in, but it is so clear now that they aren't just getting by, and it is actually a, a big struggle out in New Orleans right now. So I, I think that this season is a bit of a, hey, it ain't happening. Let's see if we, we, we got Olave. Dude is a stud when he's not getting knocked unconscious out on the field. Um, We've probably probably ridden that Camaro horse into the ground. Let's see if we can get anything for that and try to rebuild this thing because it's just, it is not working out in New Orleans right now. And that is going to have to start with a new coach. For Dennis Allen, I, I think probably the head coaching days are done. He is still a very smart defensive mind though. And so I do think he will end up with one of those types of jobs in the near future. The Washington Commanders making a big move with Marshawn Lattimore going to Washington. We talked about it. It was brought up in the, the Twitch live chat a couple of weeks ago, wondering if Lattimore would be that type of a move. And now you see the Saints kind of recognizing what we're talking about. They move into Washington, and I love this for them. Washington's defense has been playing, I think, significantly over their heads all season long. I think Dan Quinn deserves a ton of credit for the job that he has done out in Washington. And it was, it, it, it I, I think that there is a ceiling to what they we're doing. But now you address the talent deficiency by bringing in a Marshawn Lattimore. Now you can start to take this thing a little bit more seriously. And they, they floated the story out there a couple weeks ago or a few days ago, sorry, that Washington is now starting to become a destination for players, which it's never been before. Things are going pretty well out there. Jaden Daniels has turned the fortunes of this franchise around, and they are looking like a legitimately pretty good football team. Um, on to the actual games. And to me, the biggest takeaway from what was a bit of a eh, week in the NFL is that the Baltimore Ravens reminded us how good they are. Every now and then, they'll have a couple of stinkers, right? The Cleveland game sucked. The Raider game sucked. But that game against Buffalo is still the best any team has looked this season. And then they came out here against the Denver Broncos team that everyone's like, hey, this is this team's a little bit plucky. Like maybe they maybe Sean Payton is a pretty good coach. And maybe Bo Nix wasn't an awful pick at 12 overall. And oh, what's that? It's 41 to 10. Oh. Oops. Yeah, Baltimore is that good. That this was a, hey, in case y'all forgot, this is what we can do against this team that might still be a playoff team in the AFC. They just went out and big brothered them for 60 minutes of football. A, a dominant performance from the Ravens that just again reminds us all who the Baltimore Ravens really, really are. So we figured out who the Ravens are. I still have no idea who the Colts are. 
the defense was supposed to be better. I don't think it is. The offense was supposed to be better with Joe Flacco. It wasn't. And so now this is just a team that just screams mid to me. And you don't want to overreact too much to one game because Brian Flores has been coaching the shit out of that defense all year long out in Minnesota. And that has, I, I, I think that that is something that they kind of took advantage of and really whooped Joe Flacco and kind of exposed that group. But also, there is going to be a point where the Joe Flacco thing does turn back into a pumpkin. And I don't know if it is necessarily now, but that was the worst possible outcome for the Colts, who sit there presumed franchise quarterback because, I mean, for a lot of reasons. But one of them is the offense just hasn't looked as good. And then the offense goes out there and looks terrible. Now, I don't think it would look good against Minnesota either way. But now it is a really difficult situation for Indianapolis to be in because I think genuinely... The smarter thing for this organization would to do, or to do, sorry, would be to roll Anthony Richardson out there and just see what you have in this kid who has started barely any game since high school a few years ago. Like the, the main thing around this kid is lack of experience. He's not going to get that hanging out behind Joe Flacco in his second year in the NFL. So I think you need to get this kid out there, and I think you need to have him playing these actual games. But I do genuinely understand that you have to be concerned about like the whole leader of men thing and this isn't this isn't just we need to figure out what we have in this quarterback this is a, a relatively talented roster like I said I think the defense is eh but like w with Pittman and Taylor and, and Downs uh, on offense um and I think an offensive line that they've done a pretty good job with like there are some talented football players on this team they're not just gonna be like oh yeah no you guys figure out the quarterback thing and playoffs or no playoffs we'll be fine we'll, we'll just be hanging out over here that's cool they want to get into the postseason in an AFC where it feels like that is a real possibility for this team even at four and five to get it in there or to get in there and so what Indianapolis has to kind of balance now is that locker room thinking that Joe Flacco gives them the best chance to win but also needing to figure out what you spent the fourth overall pick on a couple of years ago so a very interesting balancing act out in Indianapolis right now but on the other side of that one the Vikings stepped up in this game that defense again is just miserable to play against. And I think we forgot that the last couple of weeks, but Brian Flores with a nice little reminder there. This was a really important win for Sam Darnold. Um, I have in my notes, Darnold is so important to this team. So the breaking instant analysis, quarterback, important to two football team. But th this was, this was the type of game Sam Darnold would lose maybe even last year, but throughout his career, he's losing that game because it starts off really, really sloppy for them. And a lot of times that would build on itself. And then you'd have just this head scratch and like, how did we just lose to the Colts 10 to three? Like what, what we're supposed to be a contender, at least for the playoffs, contenders for playoffs don't lose to the Colts 10 to three. What are we doing? But he came out credit Addison with a fantastic diving catch. Um, Justin Jefferson was a beast in this game as well. So credit the, the guys around him. But I, I think that this is the type of game that Darnold would have lost a bit ago. And instead he comes out, puts a bad first half behind him and comes up with a few really big plays in that second half, giving Minnesota a win, helping them keep pace in the NFC North. Uh, over in the NFC East, the Dallas Cowboys are done to done done. And I know that there have been a couple people trying to walk back the um, Dak Prescott. Oh, who can really tell what he said on the sideline? All of us can. He said we fucking suck. And you know why he said they fucking suck? Because they fucking suck, man. Um, th this is just, it's not a good football team. Even with Dak, they weren't great. And then that looked bad. Um, a non-contact throwing injury to the hamstring area, I believe it was. And um, him saying he's never felt like that before. Not great. Not great. And now, it's... Oh, I, like... It's just, it's bad. Like, the offense was bad. Um, you, you have one of your big free agent signings scratched from the game, or at least sitting for the game, because he just decided to no-show some team meetings. Defensively, it was supposed to be the real strength of this team, and they, through injury and lack of quality play, have been kind of picked apart. So, that's not ideal. And now you add on this DAC injury... Cooper Rush is going to get a pretty substantial look. I think it would be interesting to see what Trey Lance has with this team. Um, but Dak Prescott just signed this big contract. So this isn't a, well, let's see what we have in a couple of these guys. This is, can we please try to keep our heads above water and maybe make a bit of a push if Dak comes back? But I think for Dallas, what they really should do is just 
bottom this thing out. See what kind of good draft pick you can get and hope for next year that you can turn this thing around. But in an NFC East where Philly's going to be good for a while probably, and we just talked about how the commanders are just getting started. Uh, Giants suck. You don't have to worry about them. But there's two teams you have to worry about. So uh, a lot to figure out out in Dallas. In Miami, the Dolphins finally showing some signs of life. Tua works them down for a touchdown late to tie the game. Bills need a 61-yard field goal to win that game. So, uh, like, this was so clearly the best the Dolphins have looked all season long. It is not even close. And th this was the thing with Tua is, like, yes, he is one hit away from some pretty substantial long-term repercussions in the whole brain area. And that's terrifying. The other thing I have said, though, for the last year and a bit, Every time it's, oh, well, he's a hit away. It's like, yeah, it's football, man. No one was saying that about uh, Olave, and then he got stretchered off, right? No, no one is saying that about any of these guys, and then all of a sudden, well, there's a big hit because this is a collision sport, and now they're concussed. Everyone in football is a hit away. It's football. So to just, oh, well, to uh, injury risk. It's like, yeah, they all are, man. They all are. So I think you have to kind of take it at face value, the talent this team has, and how much more effectively this offense runs with Tua Tungavailoa at the quarterback spot. It might be too late for them to make a run this year. They're 2-6, and six, but as we talked about a bit before, this team is only two and a half games out of a playoff spot right now. It's a long road back, but hear me out. Their next three games, they're at the Rams, which... The Rams don't necessarily have the home field problem that the Chargers do, and the Rams just looked good against Seattle. This is the biggest game of the year for the Dolphins. I think that this is, it's a winnable one. Anyway, if they want to kind of justify me spending the next two minutes talking about them making it to the playoffs, that's the type of game they win. The next one after that is the Raiders who suck. The next one after that, the Patriots. Uh, ditto. So three winnable games in your next three. That puts you at five and seven. Then you play against the Packers. Uh, sorry, five and six. Um, you play against the Packers, you lose, probably. Uh, Packers are a better football team. So all of a sudden, we're five and seven. Then home against the Jets. Feels like a win right now. All of a sudden, this team is six and seven. Couple tough games down the stretch, but the last game in the regular season, it is at New York. And what a spot that would be if Tua could help drag this team into the postseason at, let's say, nine and eight. Um, and maybe put some stuff behind him about not playing well in cold weather, going into Gotham and playing really well with your season on the line in minus a bajillion because it'll be December or January. That would be such a huge moment for Miami. And so the the the, the stage is set for almost... that. This feels like putting a lot on a 2-6 and six team right now and a quarterback who got just violently hit the second last time we saw him on a football field. But there is a real opportunity here for Tua to almost rewrite his legacy in the back half of this season that I, I think it's going to tell a lot about what the Miami Dolphins actually have in that quarterback and in that team down the stretch here. Um, we're, we're jumping around between conferences now. Back to the NFC. The Eagles put on another good showing. And we said before, NBA Jam rules. This is three in a row. They're officially on fire. It wasn't the dominant performance we were maybe looking for, but it was still a really, really good showing. The one thing that concerns me about this team is that there just becomes a point where they just stop doing anything. That is on defense. It is on offense. It is everywhere. And that hadn't crept up the last couple of games. It almost did in this one where Jacksonville was allowed to, to kind of hang around. But still... That's that's a good win for Philadelphia. And obviously, like, the, the Saquon Barkley highlight is sensational and just shows the type of absurd skill that this kid has. And I think they're going to need that now a little bit more with A.J. Brown going down with an injury again. Um, Smith makes a fantastic catch in the end zone. Uh, Jahan Dotson had a phenomenal catch in this game as well. That kind of gets overlooked because Saquon Barkley reverse hurdled a dude. But th this, is, this is still a talented football team. The defense has played better the last few weeks, albeit not necessarily against the most resistance. But the defense has played quite well. Offensively, this team, I do think, still can put some things together. I'm a little surprised, unless something has happened here, um, coming up to the deadline, uh, I, I'm a little bit surprised that it has stayed a little bit quiet now on the Eagles' front. Yeah, seeing it now, I don't think that they made a trade here. So a little bit quiet, they didn't do anything there, but this is still a very good football team. Um, uh, out in Green Bay, Jordan Love struggled in this game, and that was really frustrating. And I, I think we do tend to 
put some kind of old feelings about these teams onto the new ones. And it's, oh man, this is, it was set up perfectly. Jordan Love, it's playing out in the elements. This is what Green Bay wants. It's like, it's, it was that way with Brett Favre because he played in this forever. And it was that way with Aaron Rodgers because he played in this forever. Jordan Love has played like four bad weather games in Green Bay. Let's let him ease into this a little bit before that becomes this superpower that he has. Like, that game sucked to play in, probably. It's raining, it's cold, it's Green Bay in November. Like, that that had to be a little bit miserable. He's also still, I think, very obviously hampered by an injury. So I don't think that this is, to, that this is not to write off Jordan Love. This is just a, hey, can we pause on some of the old narratives that worked while this kid kind of gets used to those elements and winning in those types of things? But credit to the, the the Lions that this was the one game in the elements they were going to have this year that they needed to go out and show what they could do. And Jordan, uh, uh, sorry, um, Jared Goff doesn't have the blow away game you would like. It's because they didn't need it. The defense came up with a big pick six. Um, offensively, Montgomery and Gibbs were fantastic. Goff just did enough to get them there. A nice touchdown pass to Amon Ross St. Brown. They were talking about it on Good Morning Football. Goff has completed his last 30 passes to Amon Ross St. Brown, which is now an NFL record. Those guys are working so well together. And this is th this is Goff, right? Like he has taken a step forward, but he is kind of just to do enough to get you there guy. And he does that this week for the Lions, who now, th that was... This is another one where I come away really, really impressed with what I have seen from the Detroit Lions. And now they get a little bit better, adding Zadarius Smith here at the deadline as another pass rusher. That defense was playing quite well, and they were able to get after um, Jordan Love forcing that, that, that pick six. And that's without Aiden Hutchinson, who is absolutely not coming back this season. So now you add in another pass rusher to a defensive unit that was kind of getting by just on identity and hard work. Now you add a little bit more of that talent and it makes that team again, just a little bit more difficult to deal with. Uh, it's another frustrating loss for the Seattle Seahawks. Um, th this is two, I think, bad losses this year. The uh, jaw-droppingly insane loss against the New York Giants. And now this one that was there for them all game. And it's just, it's this thing. They had it against New England. They have it in this one as well. And they had it against the Giants where it's just like, yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll oh, we lost? Oh, okay. Like, it just, it never feels like there's, like, it feels like there is another gear that this team just can't quite punch it into and that has to be incredibly frustrating and it is incredibly frustrating if say you have plus 700 for them to win the division or something like that just saying um so a frustrating one but a good win for the la rams in that spot um one more team to talk about and it is time to vent a little bit uh but it is also time to uh look at the las vegas raiders The Vegas Raiders um, have fired their offensive coordinator and are now um, on their way into the probably 19th century with their offense. Um, it's a start is where I come. By the way, we're not going to talk a whole lot about the loss. They got just shit kicked by an average football team. So again, bleh, bleh for that performance. Analysis over. Um, firing the head coach is a start. The, the play calling has been just so conservative and so limiting to an offense that actually has some talented people on it. Obviously not as talented at the beginning of the season. When you lose Devontae Adams, that's going to happen. But for this team to have uh, Brock Bowers, who I think you can get extremely creative with, um, Jacoby Myers, who is still a very good receiver, and then you have a bunch of real speed kind of gadget type of players to just have a offense that this team would have run in the seventies. And even then thought, boy, it's a little conservative. That's not the way that this team should be run right now. It is archaic what they have been doing. And it's the, the start of all the changes that need to happen with the Ra with the Raiders. I, I don't know if play calling was the biggest issue, but it was up there on the offensive side and just the philosophy in general. But I do think the overall philosophy for this was coming from Antonio Pierce. Like, I don't think Antonio Pierce was going into the coach's box after the game and saying, man, we gotta, we gotta open this thing up. Let's let her rip, baby. That was not happening with this Vegas Raiders team. And so again, the coach and the, the this mentality has to go 
Um, I, I credit him for bringing a swagger and an edge back to the Raiders, but there, it's tough to have a swagger when you're losing by 30 every week. So you need an actual coach who has an actual game plan out there to do it. The roster simply isn't good enough either. There is an entire organizational shift that needs to happen with the Raiders, and it needs to start this offseason. And again, we've talked about this a couple of times. People making the joke, oh yeah, just draft Shador Sanders, bring in Deion Sanders, and change everything. At this point, I'm open to it. You can bring that confidence in. He's going to help recruit a couple of guys, and this team hasn't had a dynamic quarterback in ever. Like, the, <laughs> the most dynamic quarterback they've had was a 39-year-old Rich Gannon. So th this is a team that I think really does need an entire facelift, and that would be something that would bring... It, it, that would be something that would bring that to the Raiders. So I am interested to see what other moves kind of follow the Raiders coming off of this. Uh, so that is the story from the NFL. It was a big weekend in the Canadian Football League. Playoffs have started. Let's talk about it. The Canadian Football League playoffs have us now down to the final four in the CFL as the Riders and Argos both move on. Let's break it down. Let's start with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I thought that they had a really fantastic performance against the um, BC Lions on Saturday night. Um, I, I thought Trevor Harris was brilliant. I, I thought his accuracy was spot on and just extraordinary all game. There were a number of times where the, the touch to just get it over the linebackers and just in front of the safeties to help the, the chains get moving. Like it was just every pass he had was basically exactly where it needed to be. And it was so damn impressive that he was able to do that. And just, it was, it was quite the thing to watch to see him that dialed in and that impressive. I don't even think the stats really do it justice for how well he played in this football game. And the, all the receivers stepped up too. Like Emlis had some big plays. Johnson had a couple of really big plays and Schaefer Baker had some really big plays to uh, fight through some tackles and create a few extra yards to make life easier on them. And then in the run game, I thought Ouellette was really strong in how he was finishing his runs and gives them just such a a unique force when it comes to that power running game. And then Armstead, the speed that he is able to bring. I thought it was really creative. From a team that isn't honestly that creative offensively, I thought it was really good to see them use both Ouellette and Armstead. And honestly, I, I thought they were just scratching the surface with that. I thought there was a few more times you could have used that throughout this football game, just kind of keep them off balance. And I just, not that I think Saskatchewan is lacking in the talent department when it comes to the receivers, but you have that much talent on your team take advantage of it. And so I, I would like to see them use that a little bit more in the, the coming week here against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. But then all of it was set up by an offensive line that was tremendous as well. They gave Harris all the time that he needed. I thought they created some good openings and some good push for Ouellette and Armstead as well to get things going in the run game. And so just, uh, again, like, Basically, no notes for this team offensively. I thought they played a very good football game on the offensive side of things. And then defensively, that D-line again uh, shut things down in the run game. When we talked about it coming in, that BC is going to have to figure out a way to not become predictable and one dimension. And that's what they were. They shut the run game down and they were able to put pressure on, on Vernon Adams. And then in the secondary, there were a few holes at some times. This team still plays just a touch softer than I would like in, in coverage. But after the Katoy big play for the touchdown, the tackling afterward was really good. And they were making some very good breaks on some balls that, like, Adams, that they got uh, they got him a couple times. It could have been a really big day for this team defensively turnover-wise. They just had a couple of, uh, a couple that they just missed by that much. So, a uh, again, overall, a very, very strong showing from the Riders, uh, about a, a compl as complete a performance as they put on all season long, even from a coaching standpoint. Like, th there was a couple of times where, okay, settling for settling for field goals and kicking it all away, here we go. Um, other than that, I thought Mace had a really good day, and I thought it was uncharacteristic, but also very smart for Corey Mace to go for two in that spot late in the game. Um, going up by seven, going up by eight, it doesn't change anything. If you can go for two there, make it nine. And we saw how that changed it. It just put so much pressure on BC and it kind of put it out of reach to be able to execute in that way. And especially when you have Harris who was rolling, you have the 
in time, like it's the CFL, so you got 20 yards to work with. I, I just feel like that is uh, a spot that they could have been a bit more aggressive on this year, and it was the perfect spot to go for it there. On the BC Lions side, it is just as simple as they just didn't make enough plays. Um, we said one of the secondary receivers was going to have to step up, and none of them did. Um, the, the Riders, I don't know if it was a game plan wise, or if it was BC trying to get someone else going, or what it was, but McKinnis didn't really get going until late in the first half, um, but no one else really stepped up. Again, like Katoy has the big play early, but aside from that, like Hollins doesn't have nearly enough in this game, and they, they just... That they just didn't have enough players out there getting the job done. And then Saskatchewan shutting down the run made this a one-dimensional football team. And it put pressure on Vernon Adams. And he is a fantastic quarterback and a very talented human being. But when it starts to get scrambling and it starts to get a little bit wiry, um, he, he can make a few mistakes. And Saskatchewan put him in those positions and they fully took advantage of that. And I thought BC did it a little bit to themselves, quite frankly. I thought that stand back, he wasn't busting him or anything like that. I think he ends up with 3.5 yards per carry. But th there was a couple of runs that, again, like I'm not, you can see the mask in the background. I'm not I'm not hiding a bias here. I'm coming from this from a Ryder fan standpoint. I was calling my parents on every touchdown and every scoring play. Um, Stanbeck had a couple plays and I was like, oh, it feels like he's getting going a little bit. And then they would just go away from him for a while. And then he would have a big pass. Uh, he would have a big catch. Um, whether it was, uh, I think he made a second and eight conversion on a, a dump off over the middle. And he made a good play along the, the near sideline to the TV broadcast that allowed him to get some pretty good yards there. I was like, this is your second most talented pass catcher right, right now. Why aren't you using him in that way? And I, uh, again, I, I think BC kind of did it to themselves a, a little bit. And then defensively, they just, they couldn't get the stop when they needed to. They didn't get nearly enough pressure on, on Trevor Harris. And then Harris, like I said, was great. And so like, if you, if you get too deep, with the, the linebacker depth, then he's just going to pick you apart underneath all day. And they're going to start crushing you in that way. And so just at some points, there was no way for the secondary to really handle what he was doing. But I think it was because of the work of the offensive line for Saskatchewan. Now they take on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It should be interesting. We'll have the preview coming up here later on in the week. Uh, also going to look at the X factors going into that one the same way we did for this one. Uh, Argos taking on the Ottawa Red Blacks. Um, nice that our X factor for Toronto was hurt going into that game. So, oops. Um, but one of the things we said was Ottawa is going to have to try to make, again, Toronto a, a one-dimensional football team and try to limit them with a banged up linebacking core. And for the most part, like uh, Toronto didn't run it all that much. That's because they threw it for a billion yards. They were just picking this Ottawa secondary apart and putting up some really good numbers. And you can see, like, I... I don't know why, but I think Polk is quite a bit underrated in this league. Uh, Deveris Daniels, I feel like some people have kind of forgotten about him a little bit. He's still really, really good. There are a lot of weapons on this Toronto team that can really light up a scoreboard and really add to some passing totals. So I, I thought Chad Kelly was, again, really strong in this game and did an excellent job of um, leading this team down the field. And it is, it is really impressive when this offense gets going. And I am... So fascinated to see how this matchup against this Montreal secondary that was really good when the games mattered um, and the, this Montreal defense that was really good when the games mattered and then just kind of eased up. Can they snap back into it now in this rematch from the East final from a year ago? So that should be really interesting to, to break that all down as the week goes on. Uh, let's move into the world of combat sports now as Edmonton had the focus of the MMA world this week with UFC Edmonton and a couple of intriguing fights that went down. Let's break them down here. <laughs> Edmonton, Alberta played host to a very intriguing UFC fight night. In the main event, it was Brandon Moreno with a unanimous de uh, decision win over Amir Albazi, while Aaron Blanchfield got back into the win column with a victory over Rose Namajunas in the co-main event. Let's start at the top. Brandon Moreno, excellent. Just a, a really, really strong all-around showing. I, I thought early on, he it, it was one of those fights that we talked about where early on, one of the fighters picks up that range. And in this one, it was Moreno. And I thought he had a very good sense of the range. I thought that he was very quick defensively. Like, he was blocking a lot of the jabs that were coming. Um, and then his footwork was fantastic as well to get out of the way of a few of the kicks. And initially, it was just kind of one big shot over the top. That big overhand right that Moreno was landing. But then 
it had a jab coming first and then the right over the top and then it was finishing with the kick uh, he did a really good job of kind of implementing a little bit more and mixing in a little bit more as he got more comfortable in that range and it's one of the things we talked about in his fight against Royval where Brandon uh, Royval figured out the 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 range was able to get inside and Moreno didn't really have an answer for that and I thought that Moreno did a good job of mixing up his strikes as this fight went along so that Albazi didn't really have a whole lot to, to kind of time and to counter off of. And so he had, he, he was just a little bit off the whole fight. And again, the speed was there. He had a good mix of that volume, but also the power shots were, were landing. And then his wrestling defense was strong in keeping this fight standing. And that was a really big key as this fight went into the later and later rounds is that Moreno was able to dictate the pace this fight was at and where this fight was taking place place the whole way. Even when Albazi was coming forward, it was not in a way that was overly threatening to Brandon Moreno because of, again, the, the volume and the power that Moreno was able to, to land with. And so this was, again, a very good all-around showing from Brandon Moreno and shows the high level that he can compete at in a number of different facets of the sport that makes him such a dangerous fighter. I just don't know where he goes from here now, and I don't know what the UFC does with him. Um, he's lost to the champ, and he's lost to the guy who is right now is listed as the number one contender in the rankings, who has also then lost to the champ. And not only has he lost to the champ, he's lost to the champ twice. So, um, or sorry, he's lost to the, the number one contender twice. So that becomes a bit of a problem as well. No, he's lost to Pantosha twice, sorry. It's Royval, who he's one and one with. Um, either way, it's a lot of losing to guys who are right at the top. So I don't... It's tough to just be like, oh yeah, no, just get another title shot. That's fine. I, I just, I don't think that's how this is going to play out. So I'm interested to see what is next for Moreno coming off of a very strong showing. For Albazi, he just he just couldn't get it going. You, you could see in this fight, he is a very good technical fighter. Like his, his boxing technique is really, really sharp. And when it kind of got going a little bit, it was actually quite impressive. Um, it's just, he couldn't, he could never figure out the timing, he could never figure out the power, and he could never figure out that speed. Like, just all of it seemed to really be throwing him off in this fight, and he just couldn't really get that th this thing in gear and start to dictate his pace and get inside and start to fight the fight that he wanted to. They were mentioning on the broadcast that um, this is his first time back after some heart issues. Um, I, I do think he gets back into a rhythm. I think that the, the technique and everything is there. He is a very talented fighter. Um... I do think that he will bounce back. This was just, this was a tough night, but this was, I think, a good learning experience for him to get those five rounds against someone who was bringing that type of a style against him. And now how do you kind of counteract that going forward? So I, I do think Albazi will be back. I don't think there's a, a, a huge panic with him there necessarily. Um, in the co-main event, Rose Namajunas loses to Aaron Blanchfield by unanimous decision there as well. And I thought Rose kind of just ran out of steam. Um, I loved how she looked in the first two rounds of this fight. Her movement was tremendous. Her hand speed was brilliant. And it was letting her beat Aaron Blanchfield to the punch. Anytime Blanchfield came in, it was just like it was a quick one-two. Or she tries to come in with a kick, and it's just a nice little step. And she got that, like, Dominic Cruz kind of movement going on with her that was making it really difficult for Blanchfield to get any kind of a grasp on her at all. And so Rose was styling through two rounds, but then a takedown from Blanchfield in the third really shifted things. Blanchfield didn't get a whole lot of offense off of that takedown, but it did win her the third round. And then after that, Rose was just a little bit of a step slower. And so much of the advantage she had in the first two rounds was based off of that speed that after that, Blanchfield was able to get inside and land her shots and not eat the counters that she was eating before, and she was also able to get inside and try for her takedowns. And her shot's not awesome, but she was still able to really start to control that fight. And in the end, Rose just couldn't keep Aaron off of her and ended up... I, I, I have in my notes started to get picked apart. That's not necessarily how it was, but she was getting hit way more and way more. And just the, the punches didn't really have the same speed or the velocity coming back, at, um, coming back at them. And so Aaron Blanchfield was able to really start to get comfortable and she started to dictate how the fight was going and Rose just couldn't flip that momentum again in the, the later rounds. It all comes down to the fourth round, which was a very, very close round. And so th this isn't like Rose just was all of a sudden a heavyweight in the fifth round and was dragging knuckles and stuff like that. Like she was still competitive in these fights, but it was a night and day difference after that takedown that allowed Blanchfield to come in and, and steal the win. And for Blanchfield, I love 
how she battled back. Um, from a, a, a technical standpoint or whatever, I, I didn't see anything in this fight that was like, okay, Fioro and the rest of this division, watch out, because here comes Blanchfield. It, it, she is obviously well-rounded and really comfortable on the ground. Um, but the, 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 st the stand-up is fine, but you, you have seen, like, that was two rounds of Nami Yunus, who I would say is an advanced striker, giving her some problems. And Fiora before that, an advanced striker, given how effective that jab can be because of her reach, gave her some problems. I do still think advanced strikers are going to give her problems, but that we're talking about the top two or three fighters in the division. Um... The part of the game that I was really impressed by, I know that was that, that was a lot of criticism before we got to, by the way, I was impressed, but the thing that I liked was I thought she showed up with the appropriate amount of urgency and really battled after getting picked apart in those first two rounds. We have seen a lot of fighters where it just, it becomes deflating and it's like, okay, well, this is just target practice and I'm just going to get punched a lot and walk away with my 80 grand or whatever it was. She didn't do that. She came out in that third round with an urgency. She pressed Rose Namajunas, was able to get the takedown and was able to kind of change the fight that way. She was not happy with how the, the story of that fight was being written and she changed it with one big move and that allowed her to really start to, to build that momentum. And so credit to her with in a round that she needed to have, because after the, after the second round, it was clear that she needed to win three, four, and five to get that victory. And she came out with the urgency that she needed in that. And that is something we don't see from a lot of fighters is kind of recognizing like, look, this is it, man. Um, so you got to go. And she did it. And she was, she was great. Uh, in terms of what's next, like if this is a three round fight, we're talking about Rose as a title threat because the first two rounds, she looked excellent. And then the third, okay, it's a takedown, but you don't get a whole lot with it. Rose still comes away with a win. And we're saying like, Rose is back title shot now. And so I don't think you can drop her too far down the rankings. And I don't think you can drop her, um, too far out of title contention. Although much like Moreno early on, we're now starting to, to stack contenders ahead of her who have also beaten her. And so that is kind of setting her back a little bit. Um, but I, I do think that, that this is a, it, it's a tough loss and it's one that she's going to be very frustrated by, but I do think it's one that she can bounce back from. For Blanchfield, I do still think the best strikers in this division give her problems, but this win gets her right back into that title mix now. Um, and I think it's really exciting to see what comes up in this division in 2025. That's it for the UFC, but there was also, uh, from the TKO group, a big night in the WWE, or a big afternoon, I guess, for uh, those of us here um, in the um, in Canada, as it was WWE Crown Jewel with the um, big belts on the line. Let's break it all down. WWE Crown Jewel went down from Saudi Arabia. Uh, in the main event, it was Cody Rhodes taking on Gunther. But before that, we had quite the show to uh, to, to look at. We start with the bloodline. It, is the, the, it was the bloodline against new, against old, or whatever it was, however you want to market it. Um, it. It was a match that never really fully got into that next year that I thought they could have. And it was a little bit of a reminder that while the bloodline storyline was amazing... And the, the last match with Cody and all of that was just perfection and a, a whole wrestle fest that everyone loved. Um, there were a lot of matches where it was like, okay, we're not looking for five stars here. We're advancing stories. And that's what this one was. And I, I think that it advanced the story really, really well. And so from a television episodic standpoint, yeah, no, this was this was excellent. If we're just following this along, when uh, Conrad Thompson and Bruce Pritchard break this down uh, six years from now, we're not going to be looking back at this match and going like, oh my god, you have to go back and check this match out. Um, but in the, 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 the capsule of this story, it was perfection. Um, it, it was exactly what they needed. I think that the story gets advanced really well, and I am very curious to see what comes out of Roman taking the pin with this. I think that is a wrinkle that not a whole lot of us were expecting. If we thought that the new bloodline was going to get the win, it was probably going to be, um, it, it was probably going to be a situation where, like, a Jay gets pinned or something like that, but for Roman to take those, uh, Simone Spikes from Solo and get the win, I think is going to be an interesting storyline detail here. Uh, the Sammy part uh, with him kicking Roman is going to add a little bit of uh, uh, resistance on, on that side of things. And so I, we'll talk about Raw in part two of the podcast uh, coming out later on today here on Tuesday. But um, overall, I, I thought that this was, from a storyline standpoint, advanced everything 
perfectly. Um, women's tag team match. Th this one was actually a lot of fun. Uh, the finish, you kind of knew who was going to win this one, but I thought everyone involved kind of had a, a, a pretty good showing and really did not, it's not one of those ones where it's like everyone in this match is now elevated, but like they, they are just maybe not to the extremes that some of those other matches would ha have provided when we've talked about that in the past. Uh, Seth Rollins against Bronson Reed. This match was a lot of fun. A little surprised Seth got the win, uh, the win. And then immediately after they're like, well, Bronson Reed proved he's a main eventer. It's like, I, I understand that's what we are going for. Um, if you wanted to get that across, I think you need him to win. And I get like the follow up on Raw. It kind of justifies like A, Seth being in that match, B, Bronson coming out and doing the big attack on him and all of those things. And so th this was obviously not a blow off or anything like that. Like this is a feud that is going to continue now. But having commentary say that right after is a little jamming it down our throats -y. And that is what got them in trouble six, seven years ago with, with all of that where everyone just kind of turned on everything they were trying to do because it was so obvious what they were trying to do. This Bronson Reed thing has a lot of people excited. And I think there is a main eventer in that guy. For sure I do. But to just come out and say, well, he's proven that he belongs in the main event now. It's like, well, he did he did lose. So let's let's wait for him to win one before we can start doing that. Like, I feel like we need to kind of... Per let the story progress before we're getting to that point. So it just, it felt a little bit forced. And I understand it's wrestling, it's all forced, but that that one felt just like a little bit like you are trying to handhold us into loving this guy when we kind of already do. So just just chill, my guy, just chill. We'll, we'll be okay. Uh, Liv Morgan against Nia Jax. This one was a miss for me. Um, it, it was two heels, so already that was a little bit tough. Uh, but then you have Tiffany and, and Nia and that whole thing happening. And it, it just, it kind of went in the face of the Tiffany Nia stuff from before where she was saying, oh, I'll cash in. I'll cash in on Liv. It'll be fine. It's going to be all, it's going to be all right. Like I'm, I'm going to do my cash in, but it's going to be on Liv. And then there was a, I'll cash in on both of you. Who knows? And then when Tiffany came out and Nia's like, well, what are you doing? And Tiffany like backs away it's like what do we a tiffany's been saying this whole time she's cashing in on live and then maybe a bit of a yeah i'll cash in on both of you um b why is tiffany backing away like oh i'm so sorry like no I, well i like you've got someone in there i can i can do that like if, if both of them came at her then there's like a something there but i just i thought that this from a story standpoint didn't make a whole lot of sense and didn't really tie everything in it kind of Look, it's not the worst failed cash-in of uh, someone who's had money in the bank, and she still has it. Um, but in terms of making Tiffany feel like one of the next actual title contenders, this wasn't it. And so it just, it kind of, it kind of made everyone feel worse. And it just added a bit of a, ugh to the match that didn't need to be there. Uh, the Kevin Owens, Randy Orton brawl was fun. Really interesting to see that there was some physicality on Adam Pierce and what comes from that because I feel like he has been so protected that this should lead to something, right? Um, and I, I think should probably, I, like I don't think there's gonna be an, an Adam Pierce, Randy Orton match or anything like that, but I wonder if you get a because you put your hands on a WWE official, Randy Orton, you are now suspended. Uh, and then he goes away for a little bit, and at WWE event X, Randy Orton comes back, and oh my, here's a heel turn on Cody Rhodes. And now Randy Orton and Kevin Owens are back together, but in a bad guy sort of a way. Um, with Randy being like, you guys tried to warn me, and then you... Uh, sent me away for just being myself, and you guys made me this monster. Or something like that. They can fill in the blanks. That wasn't perfect, but you know where I'm trying to go with that. Um, LA Knight against uh, Andrade against Carmelo. This was good. I thought all three guys put on their best showing. Obviously, Andrade and Carmelo are really, really fun to watch. And then LA Knight was LA Knight. Like, he he is... I, I, I don't know how many people are going to be like, oh, yes, no, classic wrestling d d phenomenal tactician LA Knight is going out there and keeping up in a lucha-based mask match, sorry, with two incredible high flyers. N no one was expecting that. But LA Knight played the role of LA Knight and kind of the, the, the base in this match very, very well. And he comes away with a good win. The one thing now is there needs to be, I think, a significant building up of the mid-card on SmackDown right now. Um... It just feels like on Raw, they did a really good job of building up the IC division, I guess, for lack of a better term. And now you need to do that again on SmackDown because you've kind of just like killed off, for lack of a better term, two of your um, better challengers. 
that you've been spending a lot of time building up, and now I don't know who is next for him. So that is an area where I think this needs to, to start to advance over on the SmackDown side. And then in the main event, uh, Cody with the win over Gunther. It was a bit of a slower-paced match, but I think the, the story of, like, two of the best, or I guess by belt standards, the two best in the WWE going at it, you kind of needed a bit of a that this is a, a big deal type of a pace to it. And so I thought it fit the story they were telling. And like I said before, I think Cody winning is the right call. Um, yes, Gunther does feel like a secondary champion right now. That belt has always felt secondary. I don't think Gunther winning this match was going to change that. I don't think it was all of a sudden a, oh, well, actually, Cody's not shit. Uh, Gunther, Gunther is the, the number one guy in the, the WWE. No one was going to feel that. So you may as well just lean in with your guy and, and let him get rolling. And let him have this historic first and continue with it that way. It, it, it doesn't take anything away from Gunther or anything like that. It is not a burial or anything along those lines. It is just Cody was the better guy and he ends up getting the win and he is the biggest star in the company right now. So just go with it. Um, that's our show. And that is the, um, that, that, that is the breakdown. Sorry for uh, Crown Jewel. That's the show, though. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Part two coming up in a little bit. It'll be our regular Tuesday stuff. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, no live streams uh, throughout the, the the next couple of weeks. We'll try to get on Twitch when I can, but the, the next couple of weeks are pretty busy around these parts. So keep it locked on social media. I am at Primetime Klein, and I'll talk to y'all in a little bit. I'm out.